If you've seen my video Forgotten Mediums Part 1, you'll be aware of some of the remarkable mediums from the past in books such as Riley Hagerty's and Hamlin Garland's. While such mediums may have been known only locally, actually such people exist all around the world. Now in Part 2 of Forgotten Mediums, here's the most startling example that I've ever come across in the whole of psychical literature. An Australian man called Stan Walsh, seen here. In his book The Certainty of Eternity, its author Leslie Charles Danby claims that Stan Walsh was Australia's greatest ever medium. Formerly Danby was an atheist and his conversion came when both his wife Winnie and their baby girl died while Winnie was giving birth to this their first child. Of course, Leslie was devastated by this turn of events and accepted a friend's suggestion to try contacting his deceased wife through Stan Walsh's mediumship, which was successful. I was convinced beyond all doubt, he reported. I left this house of strangers with my head in a whirl. Subsequently, he became a long-time friend of Stan and later joined his seance in a circle. Stan was born in 1891 in this country town Ararat in the state of Victoria, established during the 19th century gold rush. As a child he moved to Melbourne with his four brothers and two sisters and he remained there all of his life, never travelling abroad. He remained single, living with his parents and unmarried sister Norma. With only an elementary education, Stan began work aged 15 in a box factory. As a teenager, he was dismissive of spirits and the afterlife and reluctantly attended a seance only because his best mate Bert Jones persisted in wanting them to go. This photograph shows Bert with Stan and the author Les Danby once they were adults. Danby's intriguing book describes many mind-boggling phenomena. He says Stan's introduction to spiritualism was down to a plump, jolly medium, Mrs Beams, living in Port Melbourne, at whose seances Walsh discovered his transmediumship ability in 1919 on only the third occasion of attending one of her seances. He was just 20 years old and it changed his life. Impressed by the information that came through at his first sitting, Stan returned the following week, when Mrs Beams assured him that he had mediumistic ability and she asked him to hold a pad and pencil on his lap during the sitting. The seance was half over when his right hand suddenly began writing furiously on the pad as if controlled by someone else. Danby says, when the lights were turned up, Stan found himself possessing written messages for each member of the circle. You can imagine how astonished he was. At the third meeting, Stan Walsh had a complete blackout, which was actually his first ever trance. Once conscious afterwards, he was told that he'd been controlled by a Red Indian guide named Maloka, who spoke in his own native tongue until Mrs Beams asked him to speak English, after which he did so in broken English. Maloka announced that God had sent him to be Stan's chief guide and spiritual doorkeeper and he remained in this role all of Stan's life. During this first seance Maloka had allowed spirit entities other than himself to give messages to the sitters of which Stan being in trance was completely unaware. Stan was becoming a direct voice medium which is to say that in Stan's presence Voices were heard independently of the medium's vocal cords, just coming out of the air round about him. But Bert remained suspicious of his friend's phenomena until his own father communicated with him through Stan, speaking Welsh as he used to do when he was alive. His father also sang his favourite song in Welsh and revealed intimate family secrets which finally convinced Bert. Later, during the trance states, spirits spoke in various languages – French, Italian, Greek, German, Hindustani, and Yiddish – and in 1930 a visitor from Belgium began speaking through Walsh in Flemish. When asked to speak English, his halting reply was, I come from Dietrich in Belgium. 
I am a deep trance medium. I come from a circle of eight people. Your medium is now in my body bringing greetings to them and I bring greetings from my people in Dietrich. In his book Danby explains that these two deep trans mediums had exchanged bodies for when Walsh woke up he remembered sitting in a small dimly lit room and when he spoke he was not understood but he was shown by a spirit guide how to translate so these Belgian sitters could understand him. Well, I'm not aware of any other case like this in the whole of psychical literature. But going back to their earlier days, it's clear that Bert and Stan were young men wanting fun. Now Happy Clapper and Winks is rounding them up, coming right around the field. Kluger takes an inside run. She's gone for home already, Winks. She beats off Hartnell. Kluger going up the inside. Happy Clapper can't go on. Winks is two lengths clear. Kluger sticks on. Then came Hartnell, but she's well clear, Winks, inside the final 100 metres. Today we farewell an Australian icon, the greatest of all time. Winks wins her third queen. Failing to appreciate the significance of what had happened to Stan, they began holding their own private seances at home, just the two of them, in which they asked spirits which horses would win in the forthcoming races so they could bet on them. Subsequently, Maloka brought this to their attention as being unacceptable and not what the gift of mediumship was about. By this time, they'd already attended a racetrack and won every race of the day in accordance with the advice given them by earthbound spirits. So you can imagine the temptation for them to continue doing this. But Stan took the hint from Maloka and apart from one brief lapse on one occasion, he gave up this pursuit. And while he appeared to like money, you should know that during his whole life, Stan never once charged for his evidential communications or healing. A number of seemingly advanced spirit personalities began communicating through Walsh, the first being someone called Angus Dufont, a former Frenchman who had died 47 years previously. He gave the sitters a brief description of the world of spirit, saying it was comprised of many spheres of light and adding that the beauty and scenery of the next realm was indescribable and in relation to the earth beyond compare. At later sittings, Dufont told Stan's inner circle that low-level spirits should not be called evil, but rather unprogressed spirits, that they dwelled in darkness of their own making, based on their behaviour when alive. Asked why advanced spirits did not help them out of this darkness, he said their lack of development made it difficult for them to understand higher beings and being close to the earth themselves, they preferred contact with human beings in the flesh. Well, Danby reports, weak, unprogressed spirits were continually being brought to our meetings by guides to be helped on the road to progression and peace. Whenever a lost soul gave his or her name, each member of the circle undertook to pray for them at home. Danby met Walsh in 1927 and over the years observed the various forms of his mediumship as they developed. These included trance and direct voice seances, automatic writing, clairvoyance, clairaudience and transfiguration. One of the interesting aspects was having apports brought into the seance room. A great many crucifixes were delivered, as seen here, in addition to other items. And this is Stan Welsh standing in his garden with a veil that was apported into his seance room. One especially remarkable example was a dagger inserted into a fan, which they were told had belonged to Mary Queen of Scots. Having the appearance of a folded fan, it was actually a camouflaged dagger sheath, eventually given to Danby. Sadly, there's no photograph of it, it must have been a true collector's item. But at least we have a few Apport photographs. However, it was clear that Stan's spirit guides were a particularly high-minded, very religious group, Christian, often quoting the Bible and giving Christian talks. These guides had numerous rules for the group, for example, not to call themselves spiritualists, 
but simply followers of the truth of God. Not to allow anyone to come to any seance on any night without their express permission. Making it obligatory to wear white robes at all meetings and treat seances with the same reverence as for going to church, with Stan and his followers asked to dedicate their lives to spiritual work. The group was assured that later guides would come from ever higher spheres and this included Vashti, an Egyptian priest from 4,000 years ago, Amar Singh, a Hindu seer from the 15th century, Joan of Arc, the well-known French saint and also known as the Maid of Lorraine for her role in the 100 Years' War, and Saint Teresa of Lisieux, whose original name was Therese Martin, the youngest of nine children, born in France in 1873. As a youngster, she felt called to be a contemplative nun, giving herself totally to Jesus. But she died of tuberculosis, aged only 24, promising to spend her time in heaven doing good on earth. She was canonised by the Pope in 1925. If these guides seemed very elevated, they were even exceeded by spirits coming from the very highest 11th sphere, although there's a bit of confusion here, as others elsewhere claim there are only seven planes. And this is where your boggle threshold gets truly challenged, since the visitors to Stan's group had biblical names such as Abraham, the Jewish patriarch, Samuel, the prophet, King David, together with disciples of Jesus, including John the Baptist, Matthew, Mark, Peter and John, the Apostle Paul, and Stephen the Martyr. You may want to smile at this comprehensive list, as I did, but Danby asserts that Stan was chosen as a prophet of modern times and that he even claimed to have had his own personal vision of Jesus. Materialised painting was another of Stan's remarkable phenomena. In ordinary life he was no artist, but even so this competent piece of work depicting Jesus is just one of many paintings he produced. I regard this particular portrait as a rather cliché European style depiction of Christ that you might find in any Catholic church. But if it really was a materialised picture, the means by which it was accomplished was astonishing. For this he was said to be controlled by a spirit called Professor Jenkinson, English when alive and whose hobby had been painting. I witnessed, together with many others, the transfer of colours onto paper, Danby wrote. Professor Jenkinson, or sometimes Cecil Walsh, the medium's deceased brother, would take an ordinary pencil or pen and, using the medium's hands, sketch the outline of a figure or face. Then the medium would rub his hands together to warm them up in order to release a flow of magnetism through the fingers needed to materialise the colours. Stan then jabbed his fingers from above and towards the drawing, which would then be filled in in a multitude of colours, taking only minutes. We're told that each finger produced a different shade and that he did not even touch the painting, and it was possible to watch the colours forming on the portrait. Once finished, these were lifelike, clear and in vivid colours. Stan could also colour the black and white photographs that visitors brought with them, and in one case he didn't even take it out of its glass frame to do so. As Mrs McIntosh, who brought it, reported, as the colour-stained fingers shook just above the framed photograph, we saw appearing through the glass the pink coming onto the cheeks, the red onto the lips, golden yellow that tinted the hair, and blue slowly appeared in the eyes. This became a perfectly coloured photograph of Mrs McIntosh, painted through glass and was claimed as a major achievement for spirit scientists on the other side. This is another photograph of such a painting showing the spirit of White Bird, Maloka's squaw, who used to attend the group seances and sing lullabies to them in her own Indian tongue. In this picture she's wearing a leather headgear as worn by squaws from her tribe and one of these headdresses was apported into the seance group, with Danby becoming its ultimate owner. 
I should add that Stan was not the only medium in the history of spiritualism to produce precipitated paintings, so I'm going to divert away from him for a while to look at other relatively forgotten mediums with this talent, but I'll return to Stan Walsh later. In December 1531, Juan Diego, an indigenous Mexican, had a religious vision of the Virgin Mary, which caused him to request his bishop to build a chapel in her honour. As evidence of the validity of his vision and request, an image of Mexico's Lady of Guadalupe appeared painted on his cloak, presumably impressed there at Mary's behest, which the Vatican subsequently confirmed as an authentic miracle. The image is now celebrated in the Basilica of Our Lady in Mexico City, with Diego having been canonised in 1990 as one of the first indigenous people in the New World to embrace Catholicism. Scientific analysis has failed to explain this image satisfactorily, and in particular the blue pigment that was used cannot be either identified or reproduced. Also, the life expectancy of this cloak, made from indigenous materials, should normally have been about a decade before it disintegrated, but this cloak and its image have survived centuries up to the modern day. This information comes from the Vatican and a book by Ron Nagy entitled Precipitated Spirit Paintings that covers this and more modern cases such as the Bangs sisters and the Campbell brothers. So Stan Walsh was not alone in his achievement. Let's look at the Bangs sisters first. Lizzie, born in 1859, and May, born three years later, came from Chicago, seemingly mediums since childhood, with their mother a medium also. As they grew up, they were credited with a range of phenomena, including materialization, clairvoyance, automatic writing and slate writing, and even communication through a typewriter with no apparent human intervention. Then, in late 1894, by which time they were in their thirties, they began spirit painting, with people willing to pay from $15 to $150 for a portrait. Indeed, this man, the Lutheran minister, publisher, dictionary creator and spiritualist, Dr. Isaac K. Funk, even parted with $1,500 for several of their portraits. But the prolific author and sceptical investigator Joe Nickell says the Bangs were exposed as tricksters many times by simply substituting one canvas for another under the cover of their voluminous dresses or by hiding them behind window curtains. In 1909, May Bangs stood trial for practicing mediumship in return for money in contravention of a city ordinance. No fraudulent practices were proven, yet she was fined anyway, even though the author James Coates, who studied the trial documents, says that false evidence against her was thoroughly exposed. In his 1911 book, Photographing the Invisible, James Coates quotes May Bang's view that no two sittings by the sisters were exactly alike. Usually the outer edges of a portrait became shadowed with different delicately coloured lines until the full outline of the head and shoulders was to be seen. When the likeness was sufficiently distinct, the hair, drapery and other decorations appeared, and in many cases, after the entire portrait was finished, May claimed that the eyes might gradually open by themselves, giving a lifelike appearance to the whole face. If you want a full-scale negative appraisal of the Bang sisters' work, where else would you look but Wikipedia, home of the guerrilla sceptics? No mention in Wikipedia that some Bang's paintings were done under test conditions in full daylight. Given that you've already met Riley Hagerty in part one of Forgotten Mediums, you might also want to reach for his book Portraits from Beyond the Mediumship of the Bang Sisters. According to him, even while the picture was gradually appearing and with the sitters watching, the details of the painting might alter. In one case, the portrait subject appeared sporting a full beard, but when the sitters claimed that in his later years he trimmed his beard into a goatee, the portrait duly changed to a goatee beard. 
In another case, a portrait depicted an individual who normally wore a Masonic pin, but this was absent from the painting. Apparently in response to a mental request from the sitter, a pin was then added to the portrait in the same position as it had been worn by this person in life. As Dr Tom Ruffles points out in his SPR review of Hegarty's book, it's difficult to account for such effects in terms of pre-prepared canvases or sleight of hand. And according to the author Ron Nagy, art experts cannot explain the materials used as the paintings are not pastels, charcoal, oils, watercolours or any other known substance, except it appears to compare with the dust on a butterfly's wings. Indeed, when you look at the paintings, many were beautifully executed, with reports that the canvas would continue to paint even after leaving the presence of the Bang sisters, with changes even made the next day, such as a necklace of pearls appearing around the neck of a woman in portrait. Some paintings were said to have precipitated in as little as five minutes, with claims they were of a quality that would take a living artist days to complete. So now, to end our journey around spirit painting, let's refer to the Campbell brothers, who were not really brothers, even though they referred to themselves as such. They were Alan B. Campbell and Charles Schurz, seen here. Considering the less tolerant ethics of the day back then, it was unusual for them to be known as a gay couple. They lived at Lilydale, the famous gated community for people who believe in spiritualism, located 60 miles south of Buffalo, New York State, and a lot of their work can be seen in that area. But they also like to travel, reportedly making 22 trips to Europe. Their mediumship involved slate writing, spirit type writing, and spirit portraits using pastels and oil paints. One of the paintings is this striking 40 by 60 inch painting of Alan Campbell's alleged spirit guide, Azure, produced on the 15th of June, 1898, in a single sitting, lasting only an hour and a half. In a signed statement, six witnesses described the conditions under which this picture was produced. Across the bay window at the end of the room was hung a large silk curtain where the canvas stood. The sitters then placed whatever identity marks they wanted to put on the back of the canvas. Mr A. Campbell then invited one of the circle to sit with him with the silken curtain enclosing them and the canvas, and each member of the circle in turn sat in the silk curtain enclosure with Mr Campbell. Every time the curtain was withdrawn so that sitters could change places, it was claimed the partly finished picture could be seen. During the entire seance there was light enough to see perfectly and the painting could be seen developing on the canvas. After some music had been played, additional lights were turned on, the curtain was withdrawn and the completed picture was displayed. It represented Azur with his arms uplifted, as in the act of speaking, and while the sitters were admiring it, a six-pointed star reputedly added itself at the back of the head. But how was it completed in so short a time for such a large painting? Well, the British-born American psychical researcher Harrywood Carrington, the author of 100 books, was convinced that trickery was involved. One method, he claimed, could have used what he called chemical means, in which the painting was first varnished and once thoroughly dry, covered with a solution of water and zinc white, giving the canvas the appearance of being blank. All the medium had to do to restore the painting was to wash over the canvas with a wet sponge in stages so that it seemed to be developing. The identifying marks on the back could thus remain where they were, since the painting did not need to be switched with another one. The investigator Joe Nicol, a contributor to the Skeptical Inquirer magazine, found no traces of zinc white residue on the portrait that might have been expected to remain, but he claimed barely noticeable surface damage existed in each corner of the painting that could indicate possible trickery. But such claims remain hypothetical, with criticism of this artwork described with words such as may have, might have and could have, which is what sceptics specialise in where solid evidence is lacking. 
However, in the year 2000, he concluded that whatever the controls had been, they must have been insufficiently stringent to prevent deception. And he argued that the Azur painting, as indeed the entire body of spirit paintings and other physical spiritualistic phenomena, can scarcely be taken as proof of a transcendent realm. You need to make your own assessment about this. But interestingly, in 1941, a Campbell Brothers portrait of Abraham Lincoln was examined in detail by the Eastman Kodak Company using photography, X-ray, ultraviolet and infrared techniques, but they were unable to ascertain what the paint medium was. So now, after that digression into spirit painting, let me return to the remarkable Australian medium Stan Walsh and the most startling of all his manifestations, luminosity. Often Stan's face and robes shone. The group was told by the guides that such a gift could only come from the secret places of the Most High, nearest to Almighty God himself. Once Stan had perfected his luminous appearances within the inner circle, they were then shown to a wider audience. Apparently it had taken many months of pain and suffering on Stan's part as the spirit side tinkered with the process before these manifestations could be achieved. As Danby reports, we did not know he was to become a human lamp or torch. The sitters were told that brilliant light had been brought from the highest spiritual realms but had needed to be dimmed once materialised so that it could be safely witnessed by humans. At first, Danby reports, without warning, a thin bright light, like a searchlight, shone out from between the palms of Stan's hands, lighting up the whole room and resting on the portrait of Christ. Later, this light began spreading all over the medium's body, literally transforming both him and his robe. And it also transferred to the sitters, with one Mabel Grenville having light penetrating her gown and covering her whole back before it then formed itself into a large cross. Examples of this luminosity lasted for over two years, illuminating the robes of spirit guides when they materialised. And one night a crystal ball was lit up from within. The guide called over to Danby saying if he cared to look into this ball he would see his own Indian spirit guide, Red Chief. Danby described a man looking at him who had a strong lean face, arms folded with a beautiful headdress of coloured feathers. Other sitters saw their guides too. On another occasion the crystal ball reputedly showed Mary Magdalene surrounded by the spirits of young women helpers robed in various colours. And later Danby made this his most preposterous claim. One evening, he said, a great red light shone out of the medium's chest and looking into it we could see Stan's heart quite plainly, contracting and expanding in a steady beat. It was like looking into a brilliant illuminated X-ray picture in vivid red. We could see every vein and muscle. As one of the other sitters commented, if we were to tell anyone outside our circle about this, they would think we were mad or dreaming. Now, I wouldn't blame anyone for being dismissive of these extraordinary claims about Walsh's phenomena, given that we only have Leslie Danby's word that they're true. But wait now, if we turn to page 175 of this book, we find seven people who provided their names and home addresses, together with fulsome testimonials that they really witnessed these events I've described, and that Danby did not exaggerate in his book. They signed these statements and each was also countersigned by a witness to it. Apart from the startling phenomena we've now covered, and there's much more that I've had to leave out, if you read the book itself you'll see that much of the time Stan's mediumship was not just about these phenomena, but about spiritual wisdom, rather in the manner of the 19th century English medium Reverend William Stainton Moses, about whom I've made a documentary seen here. I will not go into these teachings now, except to remark on one surprise, in that Stan's guides denied the reality of reincarnation. Such a claim remains controversial 
even to this day, quite as much as the descriptions of physical phenomena that I've provided. It's certainly a puzzle to mull over the contents of the certainty of eternity. As Stan Walsh grew older, he became more remote from people, more meditative and religious. He died aged only 48 in 1939, thus missing the Second World War, which the guides at his seances had predicted repeatedly. In my view, it's highly unlikely that Stan was a dishonest character. For example, one of the testimonials I've mentioned says, apart from his great gifts, Stan Walsh was a good, clean-living, simple and God-fearing gentleman. His life was sensational, even though the publicity about him remained relatively muted. So there's the evidence that he's now a more or less forgotten medium. Thanks for listening.